Hi right, everyone, welcome back to Cody's Lab. So I have the vacuum chamber here, a little blasting cap. I'm using a smaller charge than I did in the last video. And 30 centimeters away from it, I have a little piece of paper suspended on a string. The idea here is I want to find out what the uh, speed of sound is inside of a vacuum. But of course, we're going to do a test at normal atmospheric pressure, and I'm going to film at 10,000 frames per second. Firing at atmospheric pressure in three, two, one. Okay. Looks like a successful test. The pressure inside the chamber is now 500 millitor. So, let's set it off and see what differences we have. Okay. <laughs> you notice how it uh, just keeps on rocking. It's not very much air resistance to slow it down. So before I show you the high speed shots, I must first warn you that the quality isn't particularly great. But that's because I'm filming at 10,000 frames per second and I don't really have very good lights. But it's still good enough that we can actually see what's going on. So when we watch the explosion that's happening inside the atmosphere, you can see the explosion happen and then the paper move a short time later. If we go back and watch this frame by frame, you can see the explosion and then the shrapnel's moving out, you'll briefly see the cloud of gas, and then about nine frames after the initial explosion, the paper begins moving. Now if we run some calculations, 10,000 frames per second, that means that each frame is covering about a tenth of a millisecond. So that means we've got 0.9 milliseconds from the explosion to when the paper's moving. Now since that's 30 centimeters away, we do 0.9 milliseconds divided by 30 centimeters, and that gets us about 340 meters per second, which is exactly what I'd expect, which is the speed of sound in air. So now let's look at the explosion that happened inside the vacuum chamber. We have the detonation, and then just three frames later, the paper begins to move. So if we run the calculations, that is 0.3 three meters divided by 0 0.0003 seconds, that gives us about a thousand meters per second. It means whatever force acted on the paper was moving at a kilometer per second, three times faster than the speed of sound. So how could this be possible? Well, what we have is in the atmosphere, the explosion happens and the expanding gas expands and then it pushes against the atmosphere, creating a compressional wave, which then travels through the air, pushes against more air, which pushes against more air that travels through the medium, eventually striking the paper and causing the paper to move. And the sound wave travels at the speed of sound, 340 meters per second, or about there. But in the vacuum chamber, the explosion occurs and the hot expanding gases do not run into the air. They just keep on expanding. So it travels out at the speed that they had when they were released. And because the gases are hot, they have lots of kinetic energy, the gas particles fly off very, very quickly. And then they fly off and they strike the paper without any interference in between. Which means the effective speed of sound in this case is much faster. Now a lot of you may point out that perhaps it's the shrapnel that uh, struck the paper and moved it and I just got unlucky and had a piece of plastic hit the paper and moved it earlier. First of all, the paper starts to move before you can see the shrapnel hit. And even if there was a piece of shrapnel out of frame, you would still expect the gas to hit it first because the gas, the hot expanding gas, is what originally accelerated the shrapnel pieces. And the shrapnel pieces cannot go faster than the thing that pushed them out. I guess this kind of means that the gas particles are shrapnel in this case, just the fastest moving pieces of shrapnel. Which I think is kind of an odd concept. Like It's not sound at this point, it's the actual gas that was produced by the explosion. The fastest gas molecules are going to strike first. And the effect of them striking is about the same as a compressional sound wave. But I guess you wouldn't really call it sound until it had interacted with something like the hull of a spaceship and then transmitted the, shock wave, the actual wave into the craft for you to hear. I think this is a pretty interesting result. And it shows that uh, many explosions in space actually should make sound. If we look at the Death Star exploding in Star Wars, one of the many sci-fi film clips that people point at when they show that sound in space shouldn't work like that, if you think about it, 
the explosion that happened inside the spaceship was produced by a very high energy, whatever, hand waving. But the amount of energy there must have been very large. So the gases produced by the explosion would have been very, very hot. Perhaps so hot that their kinetic energy was so high that their velocity was a significant fraction of the speed of light, which would mean that as soon as they were released, they would fly off and then strike the observer, producing a shock wave into the surface of their spaceship, producing sound almost as soon as the explosion happened. And it probably wouldn't sound quite like it did. It'd probably sound more like a, a bell curve, you know, the, the sound, the particles striking the craft, you know, the fastest ones would hit first, followed by slower ones. So it'd probably have a, like a roar, low rumble, go into a roar and then kind of fade off again. But the point is, is that explosions in space, if they produce gas or shrapnel, they're not gonna be completely silent unless there's something blocking that from your ship, maybe your shields deflect it. But if they're not, then you could expect them to produce some noise. Another thing that I saw in the comments a lot is, okay, I've proven that sound in a vacuum works if you're very close to the explosion, but what about if you're several hundred kilometers away, as in the case with the explosion of the Death Star? Well, I think that the explosion, the sound of it would still get to you. The gas produced from the explosion does spread out, but it's not like the pieces of shrapnel where it's a solid piece of material that's gonna fly out and then be miles away from the other piece. Uh, gas molecules, you know, there's moles uh, of gas molecules, you know, billions and billions and billions of them, and they're very tiny. So it's gonna spread out, but it's gonna be perhaps millions of miles away before you'd finally get to the point where you have a decent chance of not getting hit by one, or several billion per square inch. <laughs> so even at a tremendous distance, you're probably still gonna get hit by a blast of gas molecules which is gonna produce sound in your spaceship hole. The energy will be decreased. In fact, it should follow the inverse square law because the uh, surface area of a sphere, if you double its radius, is now quadrupled. So that means you're gonna get a quarter of the energy if you double your distance. Um, sound works about the same way, but not quite. You see, as a wave propagates through a medium, you lose some energy with each rebound you know, step. You, know, you take a rubber ball, drop it, rubber ball bounces, it doesn't come back up quite as high because it loses some energy. You know, to stretch the rubber, it produces heat. So in geophysics, we have to take this into account when we're doing seismographic scans, we have to take into account the wave attenuation because the wave energy decreases as it travels through a medium. I'm not exactly sure what the equations for that are in air. I'm sure I could go look them up, but it should be less than a simple inverse square, which means you double your distance, you're gonna get more than, or less than a quarter of the energy. Which means that at any given distance in space, the sound energy that you receive should actually be greater than you would if you were in an atmosphere, which is just so counter to what any other physics that I've learned shows. It's because it's, it's not a wave, it's not sound, it's you know, gas molecules flying off at high speed. Now what about a scream? Would you be able to hear a scream in space? Well, I don't think the, uh, you know, the, the inflection of the pitch, you know, the would actually transmit through the vacuum because the rarefractions and compressions, you, you'd lose all that information when they blast it out into space. You'd start getting the faster molecules taking uh, ahead of the slower molecules. So instead of a, you know, a, a rattly scream, you'd probably just hear a whoosh, like <sighs> as the, the gas comes out of your lungs. But there still would be some sound. I'd love to test this out some more, but unfortunately my vacuum chamber that I have right now is, it's tiny. I mean, it's bigger than a bell jar, but it's still much smaller than what I'd need to do these experiments. I have a larger vacuum chamber that I'm thinking of getting a hold of, but it's still probably gonna be too small for this. But as soon as I get a hold of a larger vacuum chamber, I'll definitely try this out. You guys may have noticed this uh, large bruise on my arm. 
Yeah, this is what happens when you drop some butter on the floor and decide to pick it up later. You know, you might slip on it and land on the step stool. That should be all right in about a week or so. It doesn't really hurt. So anyway, hope this set answers some questions you had from my last video. I saw many in the comments. I guess I'll leave you guys with a slightly less powerful explosion, uh, popping a balloon inside of a vacuum chamber. So, hope you all enjoyed. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.